Uh, today I'm going to talk about the mechanism of the Bainite transformation. You've covered Bainite in a very elementary way in part 1b and part 2 and so forth, but we are going to go into sufficient detail <coughs> to enable us in the next lecture to actually design some interesting steels. So, we start with our parent and product phases and of course we now have uh, a mechanism of changing from austenite to ferrite without any um, um, breaking of bonds. Uh, so imagine that we have an alloy, okay? so we've got these black atoms and white atoms and that we have a unit cell here which describes the initial structure. We can transform it in two different ways into a different crystal structure. One of those ways you've already learned about which is the uh, displacive mechanism. Uh, so here basically you have a homogeneous deformation of the lattice so that we generate a new pattern without breaking any of the near neighbor bonds. You can see this is a different arrangement of atoms and furthermore there has been no redistribution of the black atoms between the parent and product phases, right? So we have a one to one atomic correspondence between the product and the parent crystals and that is the basis of the shape memory effect that if you're not going to change the order in which the atoms are arranged then it's very easy to simply reverse the transformation, okay? So there is no composition change but there is an external change in shape of the crystal okay? and there is no diffusion necessary in this case. However, if I, uh, ha uh, because of the shape deformation there is a huge amount of strain energy. We, we took about 600 joules per mole for the uh, strain energy for martensitic transformation which is very large given that you know diffusional transformations require only something like 50 joules per mole to begin. <coughs> so this kind of a transformation only happens when uh, kinetics is limiting, that means atomic mobility is limited and you are at a sufficiently low temperature where you can't move atoms over uh, long distances. And for steels that temperature is of the order of 600 degrees centigrade, things get sluggish below 600 degrees centigrade. And that's why, you know, when we want to make a secondary hardening steel, uh, which involves the precipitation of molybdenum carbides or vanadium carbides or chromium carbides, you have to temper at a high temperature to allow those atoms to move and form carbides. Yeah? You're familiar with secondary hardening, aren't you? Okay. Now, supposing that we do have sufficient atomic mobility, then this strain energy is not actually tolerable. So, supposing that I take... Uh, I achieve transformation by displacement and then I take this triangle over here, I cut it off and transport it onto this side. That would eliminate the shape deformation and we wouldn't have the strain energy term, okay, apart from volume change. But of course that chopping off that triangle and moving it to the other side involves long range diffusion, right? Uh, so that can only happen at a low, uh, at a high temperature and that's what we call a reconstructive mechanism of transformation where there is sufficient flow of matter so that you don't get the displacements associated with the crystal structure change. Now you can see that the external shape of the crystal now is maintained. So you know it's a bit like uh, if you have uh, water freezing in a container then the shape of the container doesn't change when you form ice, you simply have a volume uh, density change, right? So there's no change in shape and uh, apart from the volume change and therefore the strain energy is very limited but you break the bonds and you rearrange the atoms into a different pattern and that's why it's called reconstructive transformation. You are reconstructing the lattice. Yeah? Notice also that the black atoms prefer to be in the product phase. So if you've got long range diffusion happening, there's no reason why the atoms shouldn't move into the crystal where it has a lower free energy, a lower chemical potential. Okay? So we've got a composition change here 
uh, you can see there's uh, a lot more of the black atoms here than here. Uh, so diffusional transformations or reconstructive transformations will generally involve the partitioning of elements. Partitioning means some of the elements go to this side and others to this side. We will see a composition change. So these are the two basic mechanisms of transformation. And uh, we, we need to think about what bainite is uh, in this context. Uh, some of the information you've been given in early areas is a bit woolly because it says, you know, it, it's in between a diffusional and a displacive transformation and so on, but let's examine that in detail. <coughs> okay, so uh, when we look at a time temperature transformation diagram, uh, where we're plotting temperature versus time, and, you know, let's assume that these curves represent 0% transformation. Uh, if you have a rapidly transforming steel, then it appears that the time temperature transformation consists of uh, a single curve. Okay? But that's simply because our time resolution again is not enough. It actually consists of two separate C curves. Do you know why we get a C curve in a time temperature transformation diagram? That means, you know, reaction is slow at high temperatures and slow at low temperatures. Correct, yeah. So, you know, the driving force is small at small undercoolings, and therefore the reaction is slow. Yeah, so nucleation is slow, growth is slow. And at low temperatures, you don't have enough atomic mobility, and therefore uh, it's again slow. And at some intermediate temperature, you have uh, uh, the maximum rate of transformation. So a time temperature transformation actually consists of two C curves, one for the reconstructive transformations, and in the context of steel, that's uh, you know ferrite, perlite, and so forth. And in the context, uh, sorry, and at uh, lower temperatures, you have this C curve, which represents displacive transformation. Displacive means if you polish the surface of austenite completely flat and you allow it to transform to any of these transformation products, we will see the invariant plane strain shape deformation. Okay? Now, can you explain to me why um, uh, manganese, uh, bearing in mind we have a logarithmic scale at the bottom, why does manganese have such a large effect on reconstructive transformation and not on displacive? Okay? So, you know, the change, uh, a change in the time of transformation here is much smaller than for the reconstructive transformations. Why is that? Yeah. So in the case of reconstructive transformations, uh, the manganese will be partitioning, right? Uh, and that's not the case for displacive transformations. But why is a displacive transformation retarded, <laughs> albeit uh, by a small amount, by adding manganese? Any ideas? The free energies of the yeah, yeah. So um, when there is no partitioning, the only effect uh, the alloying element has in is in influencing the relative free energies of austenite and ferrite. And manganese uh, is an element which reduces the free energy of austenite and therefore makes the transformation slow. So there's a general term people use, which is that manganese is an austenite stabilizer. But what they mean is that it reduces the free energy of austenite. Okay. Everyone happy with that? So alloying elements, uh, substitutional alloying elements in particular, have a dramatic effect on reconstructive transformations, but a much smaller effect on displacive transformations. I'm now going to add uh, a little bit more of detail to these time temperature transformation diagrams. Uh, so here we have our two C curves. And I explained that uh, at high temperatures, we refer to reconstructive transformation. So this is the ferrite that's forming at the austenite grain boundaries and thickening slowly. Okay, you've seen this kind of a structure. And uh, this is the perlite reaction where you have the cementite and ferrite growing cooperatively at a common transformation front. When we come to the reconstructive transformations, uh, sorry, displacive transformations, you begin with something called Wiedmann-Staten ferrite, which I'll go into uh, in detail in the fifth lecture. 
And then you have uh, uh, upper bainite, lower bainite, and martensite. Okay? So these are the general microstructures as a function of uh, temperature. And the term WS means the Riedmann start temperature, and BS means the bainite start temperature, that means the highest temperature at which bainite can form. And MS is the martensite start temperature, the highest temperature at which martensite can form. So I'm now going to explain uh, uh, the <coughs> bainite uh, microstructures schematically. Uh, so there are some rough scales put up. The length of a plate is of the order of 10 micrometers and its thickness is of the order of 0.2 of a micrometers. And because this is a, a plate shape, yeah, so a plate shape is, is a bit like this, yeah? um, the mean free distance is not likely to be dominated by the in-plane distance. Okay? So the mean free slip distance is of the order of twice the thickness. If you look at uh, stereology, you can show that which means that you are obtaining naturally a grain size which is a quarter of a micrometer, very, very small grain size, simply by phase <coughs> transformation without any thermomechanical processing. So that can be a very big advantage because you know that a small grain size leads to what is the consequence of a small grain size on mechanical properties high strength because you know if you have a small mean free distance for dislocations to move then it becomes very difficult to translate uh, slip across boundaries yeah the whole patch effect basically and any other high toughness, high toughness. and the reason why the toughness uh, increases is because you present a crack with many different crystallographic orientations if the grain size is small so the crack is deflected frequently as it propagates through the material. So finer grain size is one of the few mechanisms by which you can increase both strength and toughness. And with displacive transformations you naturally have a grain refining effect because uh, the plate shape ensures that the grain size is fine. Now uh, if you look at the structure and you need to look at this in a transmission electron microscope because you know the wavelength of light is roughly how much? Hmm? Sorry? Yeah, yeah. So let's say uh, you know half a micrometer. Okay. So you wouldn't be able to resolve individual plates or or the carbide particles in between uh, using optical microscopy. All right. So there's no choice you have to look using transmission electron microscopy and if you did that with upper bainite you would find that you have these plates of ferrite which are essentially free from carbon and in between you have these quite coarse particles of cementite and in the case of lower bainite you have cementite precipitates inside the plates of ferrite and less cementite between the plates so lower bainite forms at a lower temperature. It's actually stronger than upper bainite, but it's also tougher because the cementite particles are much finer. Okay, because you've got precipitation in the plate and between the plates, whereas with upper bainite, you simply end up with coarse particles between the plates of bainite. Yeah. I think you may have this diagram in your notes. Uh, so it's interesting that lower bainite is stronger but tougher than upper bainite, simply because cementite is a hard phase and it can nucleate cracks and if, if it is coarse then the toughness will be lower. Everyone happy with that? And here is a, a transmission electron micrograph of upper bainite. You can see the scale here. Uh, so these platelets are of the order of a quarter of a micrometer in thickness, and in between you have this uh, uh, cementite particles. Right? Now I said to you that you can't distinguish uh, bainite uh, by just looking at it right? uh, in an optical microscope. But given that 
optically what appears to be a plate, a uh, single plate of bainite, you've got a lot of structure inside there. If you etch it, it will etch very dark compared with any martensite which has not been tempered. Right? So if, if you have a mixture of bainite and martensite, you can easily distinguish the bainite because it is attacked much more by etchants, as you can see here. This is untempered martensite here. So um, you may recall in part 1b, we had a hardenability experiment where you had to distinguish bainite and martensite in one of the steels. And we did that by looking at how, uh, what contrast we get when we etch. Because of the internal structure of what appears to be a single plate of bainite, uh, it will be attacked much more by etchants than untempered martensite. So it's, it's, you can distinguish it. You cannot see the internal structure because it's below the uh, resolution of optical microscopy. So this is a upper bainite and you can see that there aren't any particles inside the plates but they are between the plates of ferrite. And this is what lower bainite looks like. Uh, so again we have these uh, platelets of ferrite. We have particles of cementite inside the plates and in between the plates, uh, finer, finer precipitates in between the plates. So whatever theory we have has to predict that under certain conditions you only get precipitation between the plates and under other conditions you get inside the plates and in between the plates. Okay? Whatever model you propose has to predict that. This is a very well established microstructural observation. So we are, we are following what we did for martensite, summarizing all the characteristics, the known characteristics of bainite and then we will try and explain them. So um, I said to you last time that when we look at two dimensional sections they can be misleading. So when we look at martensite plates they look like needles but we never see round sections. Therefore there are plates in three dimensions. But if you examine uh, the structure on two separate surfaces connected by an edge, then you can prove uh, in three dimensions they are plates. And you can see this for the bainite, which is again etching darker relative to the matrix, that these are plates in three dimensions. This is a two surface optical micrograph with a common edge. And all of these are plates in three dimensions. So that immediately gives us a clue uh, as to the mechanism of transformation because plates are favored when you have lots of elastic strain energy. Okay? okay, so where does this elastic strain energy come from? Uh, what I'm going to show you is uh, austenite which has been polished flat. You can see that on the screen and I'm going to start a movie as the temperature goes through the bainite transformation temperature range you'll basically see uh, quite spectacular upheavals happening on the surface. If you didn't know the scale, it would look like uh, a mountain range forming. Okay? So I'll start the movie. So if you, if you, there's a slight temperature gradient across the sample. So it'll start in one location. So that's bainite forming. Okay? really quite spectacular changes on the surface. Yeah. And as I said to you for martensite, we can measure this accurately using, you know, for example, atomic force microscopy. In this case, uh, we have to use something like atomic force microscopy because the uh, dimensions of bainite plates are much finer than of martensite plates for reasons I will explain later. So this is uh, the displacement which we measure accurately using atomic force microscopy. Um, you can see the scale here and oops, the scale here and the height scale here that a crystal of austenite which was originally flat is tilted by the shear deformation. Okay. You, ca you can measure the shear deformation and you can show that it's similar to that of martensite, which is of the order of? What's the shear strain? You remember? Come on, guys. 0.26. 0.26. 0.26. 
0.26. Thank you. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I saw you. Um, right. However, I want you to look very carefully. Right. Um, yes, there is a shear deformation here. Okay, this 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 li line here or, uh, has been tilted, but look, look over here. The adjacent austenite, okay, has relaxed. Okay. So instead of getting a nice neat tilt, okay, you've got actually plastic relaxation of the adjacent austenite. So this happens because bainite forms at a relatively high temperature. And that means that the yield strength of <coughs> the austenite is small, right? And therefore, it can't sustain this very large shear. It relaxes by plastic deformation. And uh, schematically, you can see, see it on this slide that in the case of uh, martensite, uh, when, you, when the austenite is sheared, you get a tilt, and the austenite adjacent to the martensite is more or less uh, flat. All right? But in the case of bainite, uh, the austenite is not strong enough to resist uh, that massive shear. Yeah? Because I explained to you that you know, an elastic strain is of the order of 10 to the minus 3. This is 0 0.26. So the adjacent austenite at high temperatures is not able to sustain that. And it relaxes by plastic deformation. Okay. So that, uh, that uh, reduces the strain energy from something like 600 joules per mole to something like 400 joules per mole. But it has significant consequences, right? Because whenever you deform something plastically, you create a lot of defects, right? In the form of dislocations. Everyone happy with that? Yes. Yeah, so you can see that plastic deformation using that atomic force microscope uh, image. So imagine that we've got a, a glissile interface, right? And then we cause a lot of plastic deformation. How is that going to influence transformation? Yeah, so a glissile interface consists of an array of dislocations, right? If you throw a lot of junk in its path, then it's going to be hindered, right? And just to show you a transmission electron micrograph of the interface between the bainite and the austenite, just look at, look at all this contrast, which is due to dislocation debris created by that plastic deformation. Now, that, that is an enormous amount of debris in the way of a glissile interface. So basically, the interface stops moving. It, it's like hardening, you know, um, precipitation hardening makes it difficult for dislocations to move. Similarly, the interface dislocations uh, cannot at some point overcome this dislocation debris and the plate simply grows, uh, stops growing, even though it has not reached the size of the austenite grain. And that's why, you know, in the earlier slide, I labeled the length of the plate as of the order of 10 micrometers. In the case of martensite, the plate would just go right across the grain, whatever your grain size is, until it meets the grain boundary. Here, the growing plate is halted by the buildup of dislocation debris caused by itself. Okay? It's the plastic deformation uh, caused by the invariant plane strain shape change that kills it. And this makes, uh, this is an advantage. Uh, why would it be an advantage? Hmm? Small yes, much smaller than in the case of martensite. Uh, of course, if the grain size is 10 micrometers, my martensite can't exceed 10 micrometers, but generally speaking, it's larger. Therefore, we get a much finer plate size in bainite. It basically kills its own growth. So we have a glissile interface. If you put obstacles in its path, then you will hinder the motion of that uh, interface. And this we call uh, mechanical stabilization. So, you know, if you deform the austenite before you transform it, then it will make a displacive transformation more difficult. 
Is everyone happy with that? Stabilization. So you actually stabilize the austenite by deforming it before transformation. Okay. So here's a, I'm going to show you a very simple experiment to prove this. Right. So I'll take a cylinder, transform it into bainite. Take another cylinder, compress it so that we put plastic strain in in the cylinder, and then transform to bainite. So here, for example, is the cylinder which is not deformed before transformation. And this is the cylinder which is squashed and then transformed. And in the middle, uh, where we have the largest plastic strain, because you know it's, it's barreled out, right? So if you do a finite element calculation, you can show that the strain, plastic strain here is more or less zero, whereas here it's the highest. Okay? It's not uniform deformation. So you can already see that there is etching contrast, right? It's almost as if there is no bainite in the middle, yeah, compared with the uh, top or the specimen on the left. So if I show you uh, higher magnification images, that's exactly what happens. That plastic deformation, when it's uh, a zero, you get lots of bainite forming, but in the lower micrograph here, you can clearly see that you suppress the amount of bainite. All right? So if you deform the austenite, you shove in defects before transformation, that will hinder the formation of bainite. It might increase the nucleation rate, but the particles can't grow. Okay? Now this is a very, very interesting experiment, because it's the fundamental way of proving very easily whether a transformation involves the movement of a glissile interface or one which requires diffusion. A diffusional or reconstructive transformation can never be retarded by plastic deformation because the nucleation rate increases. Okay? And you know, like recrystallization, when the interface moves, it's destroying the defects. So that adds to the driving force of transformation for a reconstructive reaction. So it's a very simple way uh, of proving that you have a glissile interface because only displacive transformations can be retarded by plastically deforming the parent phase. Uh, you have a glissile interface, whereas mechanical stabilization never happens with a reconstructive transformation. In fact, we thermomechanically process the austenite in order to accelerate the transformation. So recrystallization is actually accelerated, right, by putting lots of plastic deformation inside the unrecrystallized state. And it's exactly the same for a reconstructive transformation, that any dislocation debris or defects inside the parent phase uh, are consumed, and you grow a product which is essentially defect-free. So destroying those defects adds to the driving force of transformation for reconstructive reactions. Everyone clear about that? OK, so uh, this was the TEM image that I showed you earlier, showing the masses of dislocations at the interface between the austenite and the bainitic ferrite. And this is an optical micrograph of uh, upper bainite. Uh, I showed you uh, several earlier on, but here's another one. And in an optical microscope, uh, one of these dark uh, regions uh, which is bainite compared with the surrounding untampered martensite. This looks like a single plate. Okay. You know, if I now show you a transmission electron micrograph of the same plate, okay, it's uh, it's uh, remarkable. 
So this is a transmission electron micrograph. Uh, what was a single plate here actually consists of thousands of small platelets. So they grow to a limiting size, they stop growing, and then you have to nucleate another plate to propagate this collection of plates, which we call a sheaf. So notice that the length of the plate at the beginning here, so this is a montage, this is the same, same collection of plates. Right? The length of the plate here is the same as the length of the plate at the tip, because they start growing and then they are halted in their growth by the debris that they create themselves. Right? And that's why you get this cluster of very fine plates. If this was martensite, the whole thing would be a single plate. Okay? So we have this natural mechanism of grain refinement in the case of bainite, simply because the austenite uh, does not have sufficient strength at high temperatures to sustain an invariant plane strain with a large shear component elastically. Okay. Okay. Now, uh, now um, we've uh, understood that we have a shape deformation, and therefore it's a displacive transformation. Uh, there still is a query that you know we are forming bainite at temperatures of the order of 400, 500 degrees centigrade. Carbon is extremely mobile at those temperatures. So it is possible that you get a displacive transformation, but carbon moves about because carbon is in the interstices and it does not influence the crystallography, right? The shape change, etc., is a consequence of crystallography of the iron atoms. But carbon can move about irrespective without influencing the crystallography, right? It's an interstitial element. So we need to think about uh, whether it's a truly diffusionless transformation like martensite, or does carbon partition between the parent and product phases during transformation? Well, we have all the equipment necessary to do that. If we, we can examine uh, atoms individually and also analyze them by doing time of flight mass spectroscopy, pulling them out and doing time of flight mass spectroscopy. And the image that you see here is called an atom probe field ion microscope image. The first one is just showing you the distribution of all atoms. And on this side, we have austenite, and on this side, we have the bainitic ferrite. Okay? Um, the second one shows you the distribution of iron atoms. The third one shows you the distribution of silicon atoms. And you can see that there is absolutely no partitioning, even on the finest conceivable scale. No segregation to the interface either, because there simply isn't enough atomic mobility. But look at the carbon. All right? The carbon seems to be in the austenite. So this would indicate you know, that the carbon actually partitions during transformation, and this is not a completely diffusionless transformation, right? Everyone happy with that? So this is experimental evidence, which you can't argue with. Uh, it, it's it's uh, chemical analysis on the finest conceivable scale, and we see that the carbon uh, is in the austenite. <coughs> But let's, let's, let's argue a little bit, all right? Uh, let's imagine that we form bainite exactly like martensite. It's completely diffusionless, right? But we have this complication that the austenite is weaker, and therefore we get finer plates. So the top plate is exactly like martensite. Uh, but then, uh, because we are transforming at a high temperature, the plate decarburizes. That means the carbon moves after transformation into the austenite and then precipitates as cementite to generate our upper bainite structure. Right? As we reduce the temperature, the carbon also has time to precipitate inside the plate, and less carbon is partitioned, and you generate the lower bainite. So this is a very attractive model because it predicts, quantitatively predicts, the difference between upper and lower bainite and the temperature at which lower bainite should happen. And we can calculate the time taken for the carbon to get out of the plate, right? So here is a, a typical calculation. Uh, oh dear, the temperature scale is of course wrong. There should be two zeros after every 
number at the bottom, okay? So it's going from uh, 200, 400, 600 degrees centigrade. Um, the time over there, is it fine in your notes? Have you got that graph? Or? Okay. Uh, ba basically, what, what I want to show is that, you know, the carbon can escape from the plate within a second at 400 degrees centigrade. Okay? So by the time you come to make an observation, it will have escaped. So it's impossible by doing chemical analysis to say whether the original transformation was diffusionless and the carbon then escaped afterwards or whether it's actually diffusing during transformation. And that has big consequences on the calculation of microstructure. And there is no way that you can, you can uh, do an experiment to generate bainite in one second and quickly put it into uh, equipment to measure. Okay? It's just not possible. So we seem to be stuck uh, that we don't know whether the transformation is truly diffusionless or whether the carbon diffuses after, afterwards. So we resort to another method. All right, you remember this from the last lecture that uh, we, we can calculate an equilibrium phase diagram by drawing a common tangent to the austenite and ferrite free energy surfaces. Uh, but there is an additional uh, bit of information that at this particular point where the curves uh, cross, uh, austenite and ferrite of the same composition have the same free energy. And if I plot the locus of those points onto the phase diagram, then I generate the T0 curve. And diffusionless transformation is only possible if the austenite has carbon concentration less than the T0 curve. Okay? Otherwise, it's not possible because on this side, if I have a transformation without composition change, then I actually increase the free energy. So diffusionless transformation is not possible beyond the T0 curve. So we can do a thought experiment uh, where we take our material and we start to transform it into bainite by without any diffusion. So the first plate to form is li exactly like martensite, but then the carbon is rejected into the austenite. So the second plate will form from austenite, which is richer in carbon. Right? So it's trans translated along the horizontal axis. And with this mechanism, you can only continue until you hit the T0 curve, until the austenite composition reaches the T0 curve. After that, diffusionless transformation is impossible. Right? But if carbon was partitioning during transformation, it would continue until the A3 curve, uh, which is the equilibrium curve. Okay? So by measuring the carbon concentration of the austenite at the point where the reaction stops, you can distinguish between whether initially it's fully martensitic or is there always carbon partitioning during growth. And there are many, many techniques for measuring these things. Uh, we have to take account of strain energy when we do all these uh, measurements because it won't be the T0 curve, it'll be the T0 dashed curve. Okay? Uh, you know, simply taking account of strain energy. And when we do those measurements, you can see that they agree very well with the diffusionless mechanism with subsequent carbon partitioning. And the results are very far away from what you expect from equilibrium, in other words, partitioning during growth. So we can conclude that the transformation is exactly as I illustrated, that basically it's martensitic, but at the high temperatures where you form it, the carbon can escape from the plate and precipitate as cementite uh, between the plates if it's upper bainite. And we, if, if we are transforming at a relatively low temperature, then also inside the plates, there's time to do that, and less between the plates. So that predicts automatically and quantitatively uh, the transition from upper bainite to lower bainite. Everyone happy with that? So, um, if I go back to this slide, uh, if I raise the transformation temperature, I should get less bainite, okay? because you will reach the T0 dash composition at an earlier point, and eventually at this point, you, know, you will not get any bainite, even though you are well below the equilibrium transformation curve. Okay? 
So, uh, when I do isothermal transformation on the vertical axis, we are effectively plotting the volume fraction of bainite. Uh, as I approach, uh, as my composition, average composition of the steel becomes equal to that given by the T0 curve, the amount of transformation tends to 0. You can see at lower temperatures, I get lots of transformation. As I increase the temperature, the total amount of bainite that I can get decreases, okay? simply because x bar, which is the average composition of a steel, becomes the same as the T0 curve. So, uh, very, uh, very brief summary of the mechanism of the bainite transformation. Basically, it is a diffusionless transformation. And you can imagine that everything that happens after the formation of bainite is like tempering martensite, yeah? that the carbon redistributes, precipitates, and so on. So it is a transformation which happens at a temperature where after uh, diffusionless transformation, it is tempering itself. Yeah. Okay. Of course, there, there is a other consequences of the higher transformation temperature, which is the plastic relaxation and therefore the grain refinement. Uh, you make many predictions once you get, uh, once you have established this model. For example, if we measure the growth rate, it should be much faster than permitted by the diffusion of carbon. Yeah, if it is diffusion less, then it should grow very rapidly. All right? And in the case of martensite, we were talking about thousands of meters per second. In the case of bainite, because the austenite is plastically relaxing, that is effectively damping the movement of the interface. Okay? Therefore, the growth rate will not be as high as that of martensite, but it will be orders of magnitude greater than allowed by diffusion of carbon. So, I am going to show you a sequence of uh, four slides. Uh, and with martensite, we can use hot stage optical microscopy or something like that to measure the growth rates uh, or um, electrical signals coming from the steel to determine the growth rate. But with bainite, uh, the transformation is happening at a high temperature and the structure is much finer. So, optical microscopy or laser confocal microscopy are not good techniques because you are not measuring individual plates growing, but the cluster of plates. Right? But there is another technique called photo emission electron microscopy. Electron microscopy has a much higher resolution. In this case, you have a, a sample which is like an optical sample and you shine uh, ultraviolet light onto it that causes the emissions of electrons and with that you form the image. And you can do this at very high temperatures as well, uh, you know, where bainite forms. So this is happening at around 400 uh, degrees centigrade. And uh, if you watch, uh, watch this region, you will see individual plates of bainite forming. So here you are, very fine platelets here. And uh, now you can see additional platelets here because they grow to a limiting size. So here you can see additional platelets beginning and, and so on. So using this technique, we can measure the growth rate and it is something like 3 to 4 orders of magnitude faster than would be permitted by carbon diffusion during transformation. So that is also consistent. Okay? I said to you that uh, we can predict the transition between upper and lower bainite uh, and when we first did that, we had results which we did not recognize because every single book and publication would say that in every steel you can get upper and lower bainite. Okay? Our predictions were that that is not the case. So these were the calculations which we sat on for two years because we did not think they were right. Okay? Uh, and basically what that says is that if the carbon concentration is less than about 0.4 percent uh, weight percent in a plain carbon steel, then I would go directly from perlite to upper bainite to martensite. I would never get lower bainite, right? Because the carbon can escape very quickly from the plate before it has a chance to precipitate inside. And if I have a carbon concentration greater than about uh, 0.5, I would only get 
perlite, lower bainite, and martensite. And it's in a narrow regime where I would first get uh, perlite, upper bainite, lower bainite, and then martensite, which is what every, every book and publication was saying, that in all steels you get upper bainite, lower bainite, and so on. That's just not what the model predicted. So then we searched and searched the literature, and indeed found exactly uh, that, that look, uh, these are high carbon steels. This graph starts at 0.6 weight percent. And you can see that you go directly from upper bainite, uh, sorry, perlite to lower bainite to martensite. And then some early work done uh, in this department back in the 1960s, where you can see that if the carbon concentration is less than 0.4, you go from perlite to upper bainite to martensite. So, so the prediction is actually correct, but it wasn't recognized as such. Okay? So the model correctly predicts that you do not get both upper bainite and lower bainite in all steels. If the carbon is able to escape very quickly, then you would only get upper bainite. If it's uh, never able to escape very quickly and has time to precipitate inside the place, then you get lower bainite. And there's a regime in between where you get upper and lower bainite. Now these data are for binary iron carbon steels, but we can do all these calculations for you know, multi-component steels and so forth and work out where we are going to get upper bainite and lower bainite and therefore to control the properties. So we've got to a stage where we've got quite a deep understanding now of displacive transformations and in the next lecture uh, it will be about the design of alloys. Right? And we'll, we'll use some very simple theory to actually dramatically increase the toughness of steels without, without doing experiments. All right? So you predict the composition that should lead to a very high combination of strength and toughness, and then you make the material and validate. Okay, okay that's all, all for today.